there's power in the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus over every circumstance in your life. I'm going to say, ask you to say that with me. Speak the name of Jesus. Let's say that again. Speak the name of Jesus. There is no circumstance, no problem too small, too great, no issue, no matter what it is. Every circumstance in our life, we can speak the name of Jesus over it. Because he's concerned with everything in our life. And boy, has he given us a lot of things, a lot of things to live our life, truly live our life in victory here on this earth until we go to be with him for all eternity. You looking forward to that? I live my whole life looking to that. I do, man. And I'm just happy. Happy to be here. God's good. God's blessing. God's moving. I feel it. And I will tell you today, I just mentioned it a minute ago, but seriously. The Holy Spirit has a way of orchestrating things even when we don't know that he's doing it. And we seek God and we pray and we ask him to help us and lead us in leadership to what is it that you want us to do? What is it that you want us to say? What's the word that you're going to give us? But I will tell you, sometimes he just does things that confound the wise <laughs> and the unwise too for that matter. He's, he's, he's just an amazing God. And I look at this service today, and there are some things that shifted this week for me about what I'm going to speak with you about. And I'm no more, and I really believed it all week, uh, or the latter part of this week. But I will tell you, this morning, right now, as I stand here, I am more convinced than I ever was in all the days leading up to this, that this, what you're about to hear, and I know we're running a little behind, so bear with me, I'm going to do my best to get through this. But this is a word from the Lord for you today. Now, this is something you need to hear. Now, this is something that you may have felt like I've heard before. I know. I've heard it. I know it. I, 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 this, I don't need to revisit this. I'm going to tell you, if that's you, as I start getting into this, you're the one it's for. Now, I'm just going to leave it at that. But this is a word for everyone, I believe, but there's some people particularly that need to hear what God is going to speak to you today through his servant. And that's what I hope to do is speak what God is, 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 is sharing through me and what he shared with me and, and really given me uh, this week. So have I told you lately that I love you? Well, here you go. I love you. Somebody asked me that the other day. You used to say, have you told us lately that you loved us. You haven't done that in a while. I don't know why I haven't, but now I did, but I do. And I feel your love today so much, and it's great. You know, church growth is something that has been a, a, a subject of a great amount of study over particularly the last 30 years, I'd say. A lot of things written and talked about. There's different approaches, strategies, things that, that come into play. And uh, I would say the summation of all of those things that I've, books I've read, and this is speaking for myself here, but books I've read, conferences I've attended, and there have been many of both of those, in fact, over the last several years. Uh, not just those topics, but those are always topics uh, in, the, in conferences that you go to. But I think it could be summarized as this. If we, and I'm speaking as the, we as the church, the body of Christ, this body of believers, if we truly live by the great commandments and actively pursue the great commission, the result will be a great church. I'm going to say that again. If we truly live, important, by the great commandments, and actively pursue the Great Commission, the result, the sum of that, will be a great church. And we want to be a great church not so people can say, that's a great church. We want to be a great church because we want to advance and grow the kingdom. Not the assemblies of God, not a denomination, nothing wrong with that, I don't have anything, I'm just saying, it's not about that, it's about kingdom. 
That's what we're about. That's what this church is about. That's what I'm about. Building the kingdom of God. Advancing his purposes through his people in this day. So, Jesus left us with these instructions. Two primary things. I call them lighthouses. Everybody's seen a lighthouse before. You know what that is. It's a guide to both our individual lives and our our lives collectively here as a church. And there there were two things that, that Jesus spoke about. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But in life, our lives today, again, now more than ever before with social media and streaming services and everything else, there is so much that competes for our attention. Would you agree with that? So many things are competing for our time more than ever before. And I think as a result of that, the, the, the day that we live in, we as Christ followers... We're followers of Christ, and and churches particularly, we need lighthouses to keep us on course as we drift perhaps one way or the other, not intentionally, but it's it's a way to give us a course correction to stay on the course that God wants us to be to fulfill his purposes. That's, That's what a lighthouse can do. And so those two lighthouses are the great commandments and the great commission. I believe those are two things that everyone as a believer, not just as a church, but as an individual believer, has to be pointed you know, at true north, if you will, following. And when you get away from those, you need to course correct, and those lighthouses can do that. Today we're going to talk about the great commandments. This is what is the first and foremost thing. Because the great commission can't happen if you're not following the great commandments. You can't fulfill the Great Commission if you're not doing the first part. (laughs) They call them the Great Commandments, of course, for a reason. They're not suggestions. They didn't say the Great Suggestions. (laughs) These are indeed uh, things that we must do. So all of the commandments, I want to just say for the record that God gives us are important. So all of them are important. But these two that we're going to talk about today are more important than the other ones. And you know why I know that? Jesus said it. And I think what he says, I take very seriously. (laughs) And I hope you do too. And I know you do. In fact, so he's saying that these are more important. He in fact said that the entire law, the Jewish law, the the religious law, for centuries and centuries up to that point, and the writings of the prophets depend on these two things. These two commandments. They're the overarching principle of everything that we do. So now I'm going to read from today, Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bibles or your, uh, or your YouVersion app, you can, you can go to that. And it's going to be Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version, but essentially it says the same thing. The Amplified just amplifies it a little. And there's a little context I want to give you. If you read the entire chapter, 20, 22nd chapter of Matthew, you'll see that this is a place where now the religious elite of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, are trying to trick and trap Jesus. Because at this point, Jesus is now in his ministry. He has performed many miracles. He's had profound teachings everywhere. People are beginning to follow him from town to town. When he shows up, the word comes in advance that he's coming, and people just come out in droves. In many cases, by the thousands to see Jesus. He is the modern day version of a rock star. He is in every way the biggest topic of what's going on in the day. Now, that made certain people very, very nervous. It threatened their money. It threatened their power. And it threatened their status. And they didn't like it. And they happened to be the religious elite. So here's why now these, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you read through the 22nd chapter of Matthew, you'll see there's a couple of times where they've already done this. They tried to trick him on paying taxes to Caesar. They tried to trick him on things about marriage. And you can read that whole account in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. But then they come to this. After they failed a couple of times, they regrouped and came at him again. After he basically, <laughs> I love this too about Jesus. He, when they came to him and tried every trick in the book, and he just absolutely just left them scratching their head and puzzled, and they didn't know how to deal with this guy. 
But now they came at him again anyway. And they're going to give it one more try. So a very knowledgeable person in the law uh, says this in Matthew 22, verse 36, we'll begin. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, this is the amplified version now, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. I want to just stop there for a second. Loving people is not just saying in your words, yes, I love them, to check the box off to make sure that you're covered. That's not what it is. In fact, God dealt with me uh, a number of years ago, and it's been a part of my life, that now, and this is not, I'm not saying this to boast at all, I'm not, please understand, I'm not saying that you have to do this, but I think you should. I get to a place now for other people that I pray that God blesses them more than he blesses me. I feel like I'm blessed enough. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to say I don't want to receive God's blessings, but I know he's already going to do that. As he sees fit at the right time, it's going to be okay because I know I'm blessed. So what's wrong with me saying, no, I've, I'm okay, God. Bless them more. Give them more prosperity in their finances. Make their marriage better than mine. Give them a better family situation. Whatever it is, do more for them than you're going to do for me. That's what the scripture's saying here. That's what love really is. Seeking the, the absolute higher good for others. Unselfishly seeking the best, the Amplified says. And then verse 40, Jesus says, The whole law and the writings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. So, in verse 36, this expert of the law asked Jesus this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. Because he had ulterior motives in that, but... That's what he's asking. Now, the religious lead of the day had identified commandments. They had uh, what most people refer to as like 613 of them uh, up to that time. Uh, 365 of those were negatives or don'ts, and then the 248 were do's. So they had organized them into more important, less important categories. Now, in verse 37, Jesus is revealing the most important commandment to God about loving him with our whole being. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with, say all, all your heart and with all your soul and with all. This is so cool to me. I got to tell you, God just really spoke to me on this and just said, how cool is it that this God, the creator of the universe, spoke it into existence, supreme, powerful, almighty God, he wants me to love him. Think about it. He wants you to love him. He created us that way. It's not because he's God and he loves us and that's it. He really desires, he wants us to experience that love for him. That's why Jesus is, is talking about this the way that he does. I just thought that's so neat. That here's God and he's interested in me loving him. So cool, man. <laughs> And I will tell you this, it is in our loving as believers, as Christ followers, it's in our loving that we become most like God. You want to be more like Jesus? Love. You want to be more like him? Love, love, love. This is so important. And the full extent of love too, not just saying it, but living it and doing it and praying it. So this command that Jesus is talking about is not just to give us another commandment. It's a command that's for our benefit so we become more like God. We become more like him the more we love. And I will tell you this too, and you maybe would agree with this. I don't think there's any way that we can truly love others, even almost at all, but certainly not the way that Jesus is telling us to, unless we have the love of God living in our life. We, we just can't do it. We're not wired that way. That's not our natural flesh to do that. So the more we become like him, the more it is. So now three areas that Jesus talks about this idea of loving God now. There's three areas, okay? The first one is to love him with your heart. The heart is the core of our very existence. It's the, it pumps and beats the life into us. It's the center. It's the hub, if you will. 
And symbolically, now, uh, not literally, of course, but symbolically, the heart is where our truth resides, our, our motives, our, our inner thoughts, you know. And it's also where um, God's will and, and his affections for us reside, symbolically, in, in the heart. So our hearts need to be one in alignment with his will. If we really want all that God wants for us and want to do what he is calling us and leading us to do in our lives. So the other thing is the more that we are, that, that we are pursuing that, the, the, the less the things that would rival for a place in your heart have chance to take hold, if I said that right. In other words, God has a place that should be in each of our hearts if you are a follower of Christ. And it is his rightful place. Do you hear that? He has a right to that position. And that is the first position. He is number one or should be in our lives. First position. That's their only thing. And I'm going to say this. And some people, they hear it, they say, and they'll check and say, yes, okay, that's all right. But, but you have to really think about this. God deserves his rightful place in your life more important than your children. More important than your family. More important than your uh, spouse, your marriage. More important than your job or your pursuit of, of financial security or anything else. And if he's not in his rightful place, things don't come into order the way that he wants them to. So, so critical that we get that and that we live that way. Now, I will tell you, if you want the best for your children, God will be first in your life. You want the best marriage? Put God first. You want the best in your finances? Put God first. You want the best opportunities for your career? Put him first. Love him with all. And that's what you'll have. You'll live your best life that way. It's the only way to live. So, you need to make sure that he's in the rightful place. So the second thing he talks about is to love God with all our soul. There's a Greek word for that. It's called sohe. I hope I pronounced that right, Jakey. He'll tell me if I didn't. But I know the Greek word. It's used in the, Old, uh, in the New Testament about 105 times, this word is. And the original meaning of that word is just soul, as we call it soul, is just is life. In fact, one of the first definitions you'll look at in that Greek lexicon says this, that it is vital breath or the breath of life. That's your soul. Your soul is actually the essence of what your life is and what, what we have as life is, is our soul. Now also, as we know, our soul we refer to is what is our immortal nature. So when our physical body passes from this earth, our soul lives on. Right? Okay, so that so we understand that part, but but the idea of this it being actually the breath of life, which means this. If Jesus is saying to love God with all our soul, he's saying to love him with every breath of life. Everything that we have, every breath that we take, the vital breath, the breath of life, we love him with all of that. That's what Jesus is saying third area is to love God with our mind. Our mind is the center of our intellectual life. A lot of things go in there, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff goes on between the ears. Uh, if you're like me, maybe, not as, maybe mine not as much as yours. That's, that was sort of a joke, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying. But a lot of things go on in our mind. The mind is where we have our attitudes developed, our, what we like and don't like, the choices we make. All of these things are in our mind. Um, I would say that you would look at your mind and say that every thought, everything that we understand, how we reason things and, and, and sort of understand things and decide how we're going to go and what we're going to do. So if you look at all of those things grouped together, our thoughts, affinities, uh, conclusions, attitudes, reasoning, all of that put together should be directed and aligned by our love for God. Everything in our mind, if we're doing what Jesus is telling us here, to love the Lord our God with all our mind, every thought, every reasoning, every understanding of everything, no matter what it is, should be directed to the love we have for God. 
That's, what, that's the depth of what Jesus is saying. Even though it sounds very simple when you just read it, that's really what he's talking about. Our mind, our soul, our heart, all in. It's an all in thing. So, if you notice too, Jesus doesn't say things, Jesus doesn't have a lot of loose talk in the scripture. Every word he says is intentional. It's a thing that we have to look at and say, if he said it, that, there's meaning behind every single word. He doesn't make any mistakes. And when he uses the word all three different times, does that mean something to you? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. It's an all-in life that we live, folks. If you want everything that God has for you, you've got to be all-in for Him. Love Him with all. So, there's a guy, uh, William Hendrickson. He's a scholar. He wrote Bible or biblical commentaries uh, that, that people read, like me and others, that just try to get other insight. He said this, God's wholehearted love for us should not be answered in a half-hearted manner. Think about that. Is God's love for us wholehearted? Of course it is. He gave his only son. He gave us a rescue plan out of the things that we've messed up in this world. He loves us so much. So what is our answer to him? A half-hearted love to him? I don't think so. I think it makes sense to follow what Jesus is saying. So all of that being said, Love, greater love, is impossible to find in this world than the love that God has for us and should be the love that we have for him. The most amazing love that he has for us, we should love him that way. And we know about all the, the things about the love of God, but John 15, 13, I've always loved this verse. Greater love, greater love has no one than this. That someone would lay his life down for his friend. And that's what Jesus literally did. He just came and gave his life for you. He came and gave his life for me. Despite everything that I did, it didn't matter. He did it. Why? Because of his love. So he's stating, Jesus is stating clearly the greatness and the priority of this commandment in verse 38. And that is, this is the first and greatest commandment. Are we clear on this? I know I've unpacked a lot here. Are we clear? We have to love God with everything. That's it. There is no other way to discuss it. There's no other way to put it to where I can give you this life that you can live as a Christian and everything's going to be okay. I don't want to live a Christian life. I want to live a life following Jesus. Christian, now I don't even know what it means anymore. They've homogenized that to so many different things. I know what it means. I, of course, I know what it means. But I, just, I don't even refer to myself that way anymore. I'm a follower of Jesus. And what that means is I'm going to follow what he says. And if he says it's the first and the greatest, then it is. Because <laughs> I'm following you. All right. So I would even say, if it's the first and greatest commandments according to Jesus, not me, if it's what he said, wouldn't it be great if the first thought you had every day when you woke up is that? Just if you couldn't think of anything else, just say, okay, here's my first thought today. Because this is the first and the greatest commandment, I might as well do it. I'm going to love the Lord my God today with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. That's what I'm going to do today. God, help me do that. Wouldn't that be a great way to start your day? How about this? If you're going to memorize a scripture, and I suggest memorizing as many as you can, but if you're going to memorize one, why wouldn't you memorize the one that has the first and the greatest commandment? Just memorize it. Say it. And that's the first and the greatest commandment. Internalize it. So Jesus explained in that part of the passage we've been talking about today, his uh, explanation to us, that we have a responsibility to God. It's a responsibility, a commandment for us as followers of Christ to love God with everything. Okay. Now we have a responsibility to people. He said the second is like it. So like it means like very close. <laughs> 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is referring to Leviticus 19.18, knowing that he knows more than those guys do that were trying to trick him on everything. He knows as much or more than they do, of course. Leviticus 19.18 said, You shall not take revenge nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. Can you see how, like in the Old Testament, they're already talking about unforgiveness? (laughs) It's a struggle, man. It was a struggle back then. It's a struggle today. And it's something that we have to make captive to the authority of Jesus Christ in our life. We have to. Any thought of unforgiveness has got to go away. But then it goes on to say, but you shall love your neighbor, and the Amplified defines neighbor. How many think the neighbors are the people that live in your neighborhood? Good, there's no hands up. You know that that's just, that's a term that if you look at it very carefully, you can see, but the Amplified version lays it out very nicely. You shall love your neighbor. You shall love your acquaintances. You shall love your associates. You shall love your companions as yourself. And that's God speaking. He says, I am the Lord. So that love that God has has given us can't just be channeled to him. That's the first and foremost thing. But it has to be channeled to others. And the way we love others stems from our love for God. So again, that's why that one's the first one. Because if we don't love him with everything, we can't love everybody else. Okay? So now, how can we demonstrate that to God, look, that's the first and greatest commandment. God, I'm going to love you. I'm in. I'm going to do it. The way you do it is obey. And what he's saying is love others. So the first way you can show your love for him is to love everybody else. That's, that's, that's just one of the things you need to do. It means everyone, including those you don't particularly like. Uh-oh, now I've stepped in it. Now come on now, be honest. There's some people you don't like. I'm not talking about all this now. I'm going to close my Bible for a minute. There's some people you don't like. There's some people you don't particularly care for. You're not going to go out and hang out with them and have dinner with them. There's just some people like that. I'm going to say there's some people like that for me. Okay, that's, I'm not going to say it's okay or not okay or anything else. I'm saying that's just the way it is. But I can tell you it's different when you're loving somebody through the love of Christ. It allows you to do that. The people that grate on your nerves... Anybody got people that grate on your nerves? I'm not looking. Just raise your hand. <laughs> I got this one person. I'm going to tell you, with all love in my heart and due respect, it's like every time I see him, man, it's like your fingernails on a chalkboard dragging down. I'm like, Lord, help me. <laughs> I literally say that. <laughs> we must love family members that have wronged us. We must love people who have stolen from us. We must love people who don't dress the way that we would prefer them to or don't smell like they would, that, that we would like them to. And I've met somebody the other day, and I was like talking to somebody, and I was like, did you notice that, or was it just me? I wasn't sure. It was like a very strong odor of this person. I wasn't being mean or judgmental. I really wasn't. I was just, it was a conversation. And unfortunately, they heard me. <laughs> I was trying to be quiet, and I wasn't trying to be mean. And they said, yeah. I don't believe in all the chemicals in those deodorants. I just can't put them on my body. And I was like, oh, wait, okay, that's all right. And it was. I mean, it's your choice. I'm not angry about it or anything. But I will tell you that's probably not the person that I'm going to be hanging out with in my living room. Uh, You know, I mean, I love you, but, you know, come on now. (laughs) I was wondering, I, I wanted to answer, well, does that same thing apply to soap? But I didn't. I didn't say it. <laughs> and I didn't mean, I really wasn't mean-spirited. It was just more of a, it was a conversation. But anyway. So, and I'm going to say something else too. I was thinking about not saying it. I'm just going to say it. Because I feel like I need to. You have to love people who have lifestyle choices you don't agree with. And that doesn't matter what those are. They could be a lot of things. They could be um, a hopeless and total public uh, alcoholic and addict and go around for everybody to see. And you don't like that. They could be uh, a, a known a philanderer or an adulterer and you know that they're cheating on their wife or their husband and they, they, all of that. You got to love them. 
Not just say, oh, well, yes, I love them. You got to seek the higher good. You've got to believe it in your heart. You've got to really, really mean it. And only you and God know that. But you know if it's you. The next thing that I'm going to say is there are lifestyle choices of people that we may not agree with that may be in the LGBT community. Oh, man, it got quiet. I asked somebody this not that long ago. Should we let people in and have people and embrace people that are, in, that, are, that are gay and LGBT community in our church? And somebody actually spoke up and said no. They did. And I said, well, no, I don't believe that's true. I didn't rebuke them, but I just said, no, I don't think that's true. I think we absolutely do. Why wouldn't we? That's, that's preposterous. The biggest lie, one of the biggest, maybe not the biggest, one of the biggest lies that's been perpetrated on the American people, particularly the American people, by the media and by all kinds of other people, are that people who are Christians hate gay people. We, that's a lie. That it, now, if you, if you do, you're not a Christian. I'm sorry. I'm not here to judge your spiritual condition. I'm saying that that's not what Jesus says to live like. And if you're not living that way, then you're not following Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, you're going to love everybody. I don't have to agree with you. You don't have to agree with me on every decision and every choice that I make to love me. And that includes anyone. And I'm telling you more than ever today, I'm telling you for anybody that hears me saying this, it doesn't matter where you come from, what you've done, anything else, what life you're living in, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I love you. I love you. And I don't love you with condition. I don't have any rules or guidelines on it. Now, don't expect me to do what you do, but I love you and I mean it. I have friends that are a part of the LGBT community. I have people I call friends, and I will call them friends because they are. Because they're still people, and they may not see things the way I see it, but I still love them. And I love these people. I do. I want the best for them. In fact, one person in particular I've prayed for, not because I think that they're here and I'm here. That's not it at all. I pray for them, and I pray for God to bless them, as I just said earlier, more than you bless me. Give them something, and of course, lead them to truth. That's all I want is truth. What I believe is truth and what they may be different, but I know what I believe is truth, and truth is Jesus Christ. Lead them to that, and everything else will get worked out. I'm not judging. I'm not hating. There's no hate in me for anybody, and that's so important, folks, for the people that we don't either understand, agree with, or even like. There's a difference And let's do that. Let's do what Jesus would do. That should be in the wheelhouse of every Christ follower, that that love for others. So we want them to be blessed more than he even blesses us. I believe that's how I want to live my life. And if we want perfect will of God in our life, that's what you want, the perfect will of God in your life, you need to pray that the perfect will of God will manifest itself in their life. Whatever that may be, because he knows what that perfect will is, and that's what we want manifest in the life of everyone. That's the people we love. That's what we should pray. So, I'm go on. So Jesus completes his answer, and if our praise team could come, I'm going to wrap this up. We went, had a little couple of things in our service today that went a little longer, so I don't want to, there's a couple of things I'm just going to move, but I will tell you. Jesus completes this whole thing in verse 40. And he says, on these two commandments, the whole law and the prophets depend on that. That means everything that the Jewish people had known for centuries before that, everything they had been taught, everything they learned, everything they lived by, all of that essentially meant nothing if these other two commandments weren't followed. It didn't mean that, that, the, that the Ten Commandments or other things in the law weren't important to our lives. That's not what Jesus is saying. But what he is saying is that all of those things that you've learned up to now depend on these two things. And without these two things, the rest of it is just nonsense. You're not, you're not living, you can't live all of that if you're not going to live by those two commandments. And that's what God is speaking to us today. That's what God is speaking to you today. The great commandments are hand in glove. 
loving God with everything all in totally as we've unpacked here and loving others the way he wants us to love them, they work together. You can't do one without the other. That's how he made it. That's why I said in the second is like it. It's like a 1A and a 1B type of thing. Certainly the greatest commandment of all without question is loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. That's clear. All, all, all. And then that allows us to have the second one that's like it, to love others as we love ourselves. And the last thing I just want to share with you is this. This is something that is very hard sometimes to hear, but it's written in the first epistle of John, 1 John 4.20. Every translation, every commentary, anything you read about this verse, it doesn't soften it up. This is a verse that is very, uh, not harsh, but very direct in its tone and what it's saying. But it's for everybody to understand how God sees this. 1 John 4, 20. This is the message Bible. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, didn't say the person that he agrees with, the person that he happens to want to go out and hang out with that they like, the person that does everything and fits all of the things that I want to see in somebody, that's not what it says. If if he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? And that's a question I have that I ask myself. The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. That's what I want you to hear today. And I know because I believe I, the, the Spirit is, is just speaking into my heart. It has earlier in this service that there are people here today that there's someone, there may be more, that you aren't at that place with them today. You're not there. And that's not, a, that's not a knock on you. That doesn't make you a lesser Christian or, or, or person or anything. Not at all. It means, like all of us, there's some things in our life we need to straighten out. 